The song I'm going to sing this morning is, is similar. It's a uh, well, pastor's been teaching us. I know where he's going this morning. I know somewhere where he's going this morning. In order for us to make it through these last days, the one thing we have to do above all else is to put Jesus first in our lives. And that's the title of the song this morning. I'm going to put Jesus first in my life. No matter what else happens, no matter what may come against me, I will put Jesus first in my life.
throne. As we have come before your throne, claiming the life and death of your Son, we know without your Holy Spirit dwelling here that we may hear the words from your throne that we may understand the words surrender to your word applied into our lives this time is of no value we confess our sinfulness and need of purification of your Holy Spirit to purge out everything that is not of you. That we may rightly understand and be transformed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are going to once again find out if somebody's been listening because I'm not sure it's either going to be two weeks from today or three weeks from today is your final test. So as, as your teacher, I need to make sure that you're, you're learning and understanding. For we have covered a lot of material in Revelation 13. It's basic Adventism. The problem is that Seventh-day Adventists, we really, as a people, have no clue what basic Adventism is. So we're going to take a few minutes again to remind ourselves of the importance of knowing without a shadow of a doubt each and every aspect of Revelation 13. To be able to correctly apply it into the third angel's message of Revelation 14. So open up your Bibles. And we're going to begin with what verse? 11. Wrong. One. Chapter 13, verse 1 is where we're going to begin. We're going to get to verse 11 eventually. And it says, And I stood on the sea, sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having... How many heads? Seven. Seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name blasphemy. Now, what beast is this? Papal Rome. Okay. Papal Rome. Why is there seven heads? What does the seven heads represent? Okay. You're going to have to go do some more research. Listen to the past sermons because we told you exactly what it was. The seven forms of Roman government. Okay. This is specific. We dealt with it about four weeks ago. What do the ten horns represent? Ten kingdoms. Ten kingdoms, okay. Now, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, feet were as the feet of a bear, and they mouth the mouth of a lion. What are all of those aspects? Why did this beast have these different aspects in its features? It was an amalgamation of two different kingdoms. All right. It was an amalgamation of the previous three kingdoms in this kingdom. Very good. 
and the dragon gave him his power. So we're going to put on the screen the dragon. Who's the dragon? It's on the screen. If you can't read the screen, you're in trouble. Pagan Rome. Pagan Rome. Okay. Apostate Adventism says it's Satan. Okay? But we have proven without a shadow of a doubt that it cannot be Satan. Why? All right, the, the rest of the verse tells us why. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and what? Great authority. Great authority. Now even though Satan was inspiring pagan Rome, pagan Rome is the one that actually did the duty, didn't it? Yes. How did pagan Rome give it its seat? Justinian in 538 A.D. Okay, Justinian in 538 A.D. We're going to come back to that again a little bit later. Now, what does it mean to for the beast, the seven-headed beast, to come out of the sea? We've already identified the, se the seven-headed beast as to be in Papal Rome, so what does it mean for this beast to come up out of the sea? Uh, the sea of the people, in this case, the extent of the pagan Roman Empire. Okay. David, glad to see you here today. Populated area. The pop what? Populated area. Okay. That is the apostate view. It's the apostate view. <laughs> we need to understand that Adventism has been warped and changed, okay, to make it something it is not. Why, Tim, you said it was the area of the Roman Empire where the ten kingdoms are, were established. Why is it necessary for it to be that area is where the peoples, nations, and tongues are. Okay, that's where its power was from. What else? Okay. Think about it for a second. The feet were what? The head was what? The body was what? The leopard. Okay. So what area did all those cover? The same area the Roman care was in control of. Now this is significant because without this knowledge that the Bible is not speaking of the entire world or the entire civilized world, or where people are congregated because China is not part of the prophecy yet, is it? No. Was it populated over there? Yes. Okay. But it was not part of the Bible prophecy yet. So it cannot be recognized here. Rome, Papal Rome comes out of its authority, out of what pagan Rome's authority was. And that is the Ten Kingdom area. Now, there is a reason for it. Now, we're going to ask the question. What does it mean for this papal Rome power, this beast power, to wear out the saints? What does it mean to wear out the saints? Persecute? Change doctrines or try to hide the truth. Okay, hide the truth, but that's really not what wearing out the saints is. Kill. What's that? Kill. To kill and to destroy. Remember we talked about this a couple of weeks ago where Papal Rome, we have almost no written record of many of the mountain nations 
that went against papal Rome. The Waldensians and several other peoples, they went in and genocide them, destroyed all their writings, everything, and the only record we have of them is what record? Rome's record. Rome's record of what they did. You don't find much else. All right. The deadly wound. When was the deadly wound given to this beast, power? When the Pope was taken captive. When the Pope was given, taken captive by who? Berthier. Okay, when was that? 1798. You didn't know you were coming to church to have a history lesson, did you? We're trying to learn a few things here now. When was the deadly wound healed? Okay, when did the healing, when was it made possible for the wound to be healed? Because that's the, that's the first question. We need to understand this in chronological history. When was it made possible to be healed? When Napoleon reinstituted re Roman Catholicism, not as a civil government, but as a religion. Okay? When was that? 1802, 1801, 82, right in that, I can't remember the, I don't have it in my notes, but it was about three to four years after the Pope was taken captive. He died in captivity, and there was about a year, year and a half where there was no Pope, there was nothing. If, we need to understand, if Napoleon had not reinstituted the Catholic religion, it would not exist today. That's how much Berthier did when he took the Pope. He annulled every civil law action by the papal system. He said, none of it exists anymore. You're all free. <laughs> and so there was no binding of any aspect. So when did the when, when was it healed? See, some of us have missed a few sermons and we don't remember. When was the first healing? Well, I'm going to tell you because otherwise you're not going to know it. I guess. 1815. I'm going to give you a quote in just a minute to show you that that's when, they, that's when the first healing. That was the healing when the papal system was recognized by the European countries as a civil ecclesiastical power once again. 1815. Was that the complete healing of the beast? No. Why? There is it did not reinstitute itself to the complete authority of parties to have. Okay. It was not effective worldwide either. Now, we talked about the beast coming up out of the sea, representing the Ten Kingdom of the old Roman Empire area. Did you know that areas of Spain, North Africa, and the Ottoman Empire at this particular time, in the Dark Ages, all the way up through the late 1700s, was controlled not by Rome, but by what power? The Muslim. Did you know that the Muslim schools taught that the school that the earth was round? Yes, they did. Guess what the papal schools taught? Flat. It was flat. Mm -hmm. Not all the world thought the, the world was flat. Only the papal schools. 
the schools that were approved by papacy. But there were schools outside of its realm that had not control that literally taught that the earth was round. That God created this world. All of the different other aspects. In 1980 is when the healing of the deadly wound was completed. And now we're going to find out why that is. Joseph Bates, writing in 1851, said, In A.D. 1815, then a general restoration, in other words, he said, general restoration of dominions, kingdoms, and thrones took place, in which Rome, with its pope, was once more reinstated in its ancient dominion with civil and ecclesiastical power. From hence it would seem that the deadly wound was healed. Not that it was, but it would seem to be healed. When you get cut, you have a scab over it, right? Is it completely healed yet? No. No. That scab is there to protect it, to complete its healing process. You can kind of say that this is where the scab kind of hardens over and is starting to heal now. It's right now in 1815. Essen Haskell puts it this way. The return to papal principles in Europe is the partial healing of the wound that had. But the fuller development of all the powers of that beast which combined the characteristics of Babylon, Persia, and Greece in once free, liberty-loving America will be the complete healing of the deadly wound. Wow. 75 years before Reagan made his unholy alliance, Essen Haskell nailed it right on the right on the dot. The two-horned beast. Who is the two-horned beast? The United States. United States. Why is it why do we know it's the United States? Go to that slide. Why do we know that the two-horned beast is the United States? Now we get to verse 11. <laughs> Okay, all of the characteristics here now is going to be unequivocally the only possible way. We spent a, an entire hour sermon, and I'm not going to want to do that because otherwise I wouldn't have time to get to the rest of my sermon. This other beast come up out of the earth. What does it mean to say it come up out of the earth? Someplace separate from our own control. Okay. Something separate, a place in this world separate from where Roman control or the Roman Empire existed. Because remember, the vision of Daniel 2, the vision of Daniel 7, did it have a fifth empire? Except for Christ, there was no other world empire available in those two visions, correct? But here in Revelation 13, we're finding that Revelation, John tells us that there is a fifth world empire. Why was Daniel not given five instead of he was only given four. You have to ask God when you get to heaven. I don't know. <laughs> but it gives us a clue. It gives us a clue to understand that Bible prophecy was dealt with Daniel was with just this one area of the world. Out of the earth, out of the other aspects of the world would come another power a different way. 
how did the previous four world powers come into existence? Did they come in just by war? By war. How did this beast come into existence? Peace. Peace. What was the difference when the revol was the Revolutionary War peaceful? No, it wasn't. So what was different about the war, Revolutionary War that the other were the other empires, when they were brought into existence, they had war too, but what was significant about their war versus the Revolutionary War? We need to know this stuff. This is basic Adventism. We've got to know it and be secure in it. What was the difference? The Revolutionary War was fought solely to protect the rights of the, the right people. To the other nations, the war was to destroy the people to raise up another dominating force to put the people under subjection. The total opposite. You see the difference? You've got to understand this. One out of the sea, one out of the earth. One war is brought for the rights of the people, the other one is not for the rights of the people. I guess that's enough. You need to, you need to go back and study these because we've got... I may end up having two sermons in your uh, final test because I've got all these he's and him's and his all the hisses in Revelation 13 are not the same. All the hymns are not the same. All the he's are not the same. Those pronouns, they change who they are. And we've got to know when we're reading through this who this him is and who this he is because it will be confusing if you don't know. And someone will trip you up. And you're going to notice that today as we continue. You see, as we've reviewed this morning, the meanings of the symbolization in, Re in Revelation 13, we have gained a, an ex insight that God wants us to be settled and secure in exactly what is going to be and what has happened and what is going to happen in the future. Because when we rightly determine every step of Revelation, nothing will be a surprise to us. Nothing. We will know and recognize it all. God has given us this accurate knowledge, yet what have we done with it this year? This year is closing. This is the last Sabbath of 2014. We've had a lot of sermons on Bible prophecy. Have you made it yourself? Have you made it yours? Or you just listen on Sabbath? Boy, Pastor, you did a good sermon that day. But did you really study it? Because see, if all you did was listen to it on Sabbath and go home, you're a pig. Okay? You're a pig. Because a pig will eat anything, swallow it, and it don't care what it ate. But if you took what was preached from this desk and you took it and you took it home and you started studying your Bible with it, now you're a cow. And cows are the only thing spiritually that are going to make it into heaven. The Berean, the faithful ones, learning, studying for themselves, they're the ones that are going to make it in heaven, not the pig. We need to see tangible application in our lives of Bible prophecy with the knowledge that we're given. What will be our determination in the new year as it begins? Will we remain in a state of insubordination that has caused our Heavenly Father pain and suffering beyond the comprehension of any one of our human minds can understand, think, or even have a clue? of what he goes through? 
We've only learned in part of Revelation 13 a detailed description of the beast of the seven heads, the power that came from, and what it was doing and what it is doing right now. But with this knowledge, we can take and begin now the process of applying the next phrases of the prophecies of Revelation 13. The two-horned beast, which is the United States, deceives how much of the earth? Okay? All the earth. What does it mean when it says all the earth? Is that the whole world? No, it doesn't. No, no, no. <laughs> Remember, the two-horned beast come out of the what? Earth. Earth. Its job is to deceive everywhere where the papal system is not in control. Yes, that's correct. It's the only part that needs to be deceived. Everybody else is already taken care of. Amen. We got to understand this. God didn't give this for just to listen to. There's a significant reason for this. We're going to get to it the end, by the end of the day and you're going to go, whoa. You've already learned that the two-horned beast comes up out of the earth. Therefore, we need to understand the Bible, yes, Tim, it is consistent. Let's not mess this up. Revelation 13, 14. This two-horned beast makes a proclamation of deception that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live. The making of the image is understood only by the history that is being repeated in the making of the image. When the image is made, history will totally be repeated. How was the beast formed? Justinian, we talked about it earlier, Justinian, the emperor of pagan Rome, gave all the power of pagan Rome to the bishop of Rome whom he elected. And that was Vigilus. Vigilus was made pope in 538 AD. Was Vigilus a Christian? No. No, he wasn't. It's a great conversational starter to ask a Roman Catholic, has every pope been a Christian? And they'll, I'll tell you, they'll tell you right off the bat, right, right, right without thinking, well, of course they were. <laughs> So when you start recanting the history of the papal system, that Vigilus was put in as Pope and was fully pagan. Nothing to do with Christianity. It's significant. But not only that, in this uniting of the civil power to the church in the making of the beast, this Pope did something that was never rescinded. Do you know what that is? Death penalty. The death penalty, that is correct. The death penalty against anyone who violated the sacredness of Sunday worship. That was in 538 A.D. Up until then, there were Seventh-day Baptists, I mean, Seventh-day Catholics. Yeah. 
Yeah. They were Roman Catholics in good and regular standing that kept the Seventh day Sabbath. Yeah. They were completely done away with, totally, completely at the Council of Trent. But that's another whole study. Revelation 13, 15, that they should make it. Huh. I messed up that slide. I'm sorry. Revelation 13, 15. Read out of your Bible. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both what? Speak and cause that as many as would not worship what? The image, the image of the beast should be killed. Should be killed. Not, the yep. not the beast, the image of the beast. Would it be a good idea to know what the image of the beast is? Yeah. Amen. That's right. Now notice, an image that is made is given what? Life. Yeah. Life. Life comes from whom? God. Not in this instance. Oh. Not in this instance. From the beast itself. Where does the image of the beast get its life? From the beast. No, not from the beast. He had power. See, this is one of those he's. Not all he's are the same. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Who is the he there? No. Satan. No. The two horned beast. Remember, let's go backwards. Up your Bible, get your Bibles there in front of you. The two horned beast, the, the another beast, the two horns, like a lamb, spake of the dragon, okay? He doeth great wonders to make fire come down from heaven. Who is that he? Two horned beast, which is America. United States. Then we keep going down, verse 14. And deceivest them on the earth by the miracles which he had power to do. Who, who's the he? Two horned beast, United States. In the sight of the beast, which is the papal power system, saying to them, dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. Now we haven't identified the image yet, but we're going to get there. And he, who's the he there? The two horned beast, beast United States. Yeah. The United States gives life to the image. Right. All right. Now, what happens when what when the image gets life? What does the Bible say it's going to do? Speak. It's going to do what? Speak and cause. Cause. In other words, it's going to speak and it's going to do a work. Right. Yeah. All right. We must see that clearly in God's word. There is an image that is first given life. And then A.T. Jones brings it very clearly. He lays it right out here. He says, then in a speaking image, then an acting image, it is to be therefore a living, speaking, acting image of the papacy. Yeah. Remember, Image to the beast means image to the papacy. Because the beast power is what? The papacy. the papacy. We're not trying to confuse you here. Grant is still buried in Grant's tomb. At least that's the presumption. They didn't put Lincoln there. All right? Then it will be, it will not be a mere stature or a picture on paper, lifeless, but it will be a living image of the 
original. It will be alive. It will be up. It will live like the other. What's the other? Papacy. The papacy. Thank you. And it will speak like what? The other. The other. It will act, act like the other. This image of the beast speaks like the papacy, acts like the papacy, lives like the papacy. Otherwise, it's not the image of the beast. With this established and understood, we can be settled to know this image will speak and act just like the beast described in the first ten verses of Revelation 13. How did the beast speak and act? Now from the description given in the Word of God, anyone can see that the beast is the papacy. And in the nature of things, the image of the beast is the image of the papacy. What then in a word is the papacy? It is a union of church and state. With the church, what? Supreme. And using the power of the state for her, her despotic and persecuting purchase purposes and the beast is formed by the union of the fallen church with the mighty Roman world power in the nature of things therefore the image of the beast would be a another great and notable instance of the fallen church uniting with a mighty world power using that power of the state in the likeness of the papacy. We're getting into basic historic Adventism here. We need to understand this image of the beast is given life by the United States and this image will act, it will speak, and it will do the same works as the papacy did in its past. Never forget, pagan Rome in its dying power gave all of its strength to the hands of what power? Pagan Rome was dying. It gave all of its power and strength to where? Papal power. Giving all that power, the fallen church could now force its will, its dogmas on the people against the conscience and put to death those in opposition. Until then, the Roman Catholic Church couldn't do that. That's right. The image to the beast, or stated another way, the image to papal dictate, rule, and power is formed when the United States gives its strength to the United Apostate Protestant Churches to bring peace where no peace can be found. Now we talked about this last time of who the image of the beast was. We documented it all. I wasn't going to go through all that. We're just identifying it, reminding ourselves again that apostate Protestantism is the image to the beast. But all apostate Protestantism has to be united for a purpose. And that purpose is to put their form of dead Christianity as what is truth and condemn everyone else if they do not follow it. Apostate professed Protestant church 
has joined hands uniting itself to the papal principles. We documented this two years ago that in 2005 it was sealed. The United Churches of Protestantism united and then joined hands completely and totally with Catholicism. They had a purpose. I didn't put all the quotes in my notes because it would just made the sermon way too long. But they tried with all of these head ministers to bring forth the religious laws during the era of the first bush all the way through to the second bush. And they failed every time. But there was something missing. And today we're going to learn out what that was that was missing. The apostate Protestant church has not received life from the two-horned beast yet. You see, it is the two-horned beast that says we've got to have this image. The image itself isn't the one who demands the life. The two-horned beast gives it life. We, we need to follow and understand things of what's going on in our world. Over the last few years, there are some significant things that's happened. You see, the unification was done for the two main purposes, uniting on common faith to affect change in laws, moral and religious, to have a moral religious government. The image has been made, but life must be given to it. There's no life right now, but life will be given to it. Life is needed. Life is what it desires, and life will be given to it. How easy will life be given to this image? One just needs to consider the precedence of past presidential action. Both Clinton and Bush gave power to a non-governmental entity to write laws to be forced upon the people with the continual mixing of the philosophy of the world with the truth of God offered by the apostate churches in the place of the transforming gospel of present truth will bring such a weakness to reach the soul of men that they will compel the civil powers to give us life that we will be able to force just as the old beast in the past. It is then in this environment that quickly will begin violent persecution of those refusing to support the spiritual revival and world transformation. Surely then the new world order will be in full force. The conscience of the individual will be lost for the good and peace of a whole nation. Don't think these riots on race is all about race. Don't think that all these things that are going on are about what you think they're about going on. I have heard of a good many individuals celebrities, athletes, all of these people who are, quote, born again. Saying, we've got to get this nation back to Jesus. And it's not the Jesus Christ that died for you either. You've got to get back. The church has got to get its people back in church on the Sabbath day, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Count 
calendars are being changed. And yes, it's been in Europe for years now where Sunday is the seventh day of the week. In the South Pacific now all calendars have seventh day as Sunday. And that is the reason why one of the reasons why the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists said it's okay to worship on Sunday because on the calendar it's the seventh day. I about fell off my chair when God I read it. Yeah. It's coming, folks. It's coming. And it's coming faster than you think it's coming. Are you going to worship on the world's identification of the seventh day when the seventh day is Sunday? Or are you going to go to come to church on the sixth day because it's really the seventh? You know, there's, it's interesting. I was listening to a historical documentary on the bringing forth of the, of the United States government and, and and the, and the presidents. And I believe it's George Washington, Mount Vernon was George Washington's place, right? Yeah. Well, he built that up. And in there, he's got this grandfather pendulum clock that works on the seven day cycle. And when they built it, they had to literally identify the days of the week and it went right through the main floor to the basement and they've got Sunday at the top and the Sabbath at the bottom and when the whole world says Sunday is the seventh day of the week they're going to have to destroy that monument or do something to change it because guess what there will be a standing to rebuke not only the law of God, but what man put years ago. We need to understand what the truth is and be settled in it. But it's going to get deeper than that. You see, everything has been formed, ready to be set in motion. The image has been in its molding process ready to receive life. Before the image can speak and act, life must be given to it. In reference to Congress declaring laws of Sunday observance and its consequences, A.T. Jones spoke the following. The thing must be made before life can be given to it. And so far, as the making of it goes, that has certainly been done by this decision. As it could possibly be done in any other way. He had no clue of what was going to be happening down the road. We have hindsight and foresight when we understand prophecy now. As long as it will be before the evil thing shall be given life, by the enactment or enforcement of whatever religious laws or observances bigotry in possession of the power may choose to enforce. As to this, he says, I know nothing. I know what's going to happen. I know life is going to be given to it. I just don't know when. We're living in the when, folks. Amen. We're living in the when. You can't be like A.T. Jones and say, I know nothing. In regard to the civil laws of the government, this since 1976, we've been living on the precipice of eternity since 1976. The president has been given certain authorities in times of emergency. Starting with Nixon, the National Emergencies Act 
first approved by Congress and continues in a perpetual re-establishment. And they just keep adding more things that, that the president is able to do every year. There's other things added that they didn't think about in 76. Continues to this very day. And this is the primary statement that I wanted to bring out. The president, in the case of any national emergency, shall decree any moral actions needed to assure the American citizens of their national heritage under what? Under God. God. Under God. In this declaration, it gives the president authority to remove and literally abolish all forms of government in the United States except for the presidency. It goes even farther than that. You see, attempts have failed in the past to bring about religious laws enforcing the dogmas of the apostate Protestantism, but this will soon be no longer the case. And once life is given, the direct result, forced worship, will fast come. Remember, the image is a representation of the beast, which is the papacy, which has the incarnation of Satan. The beast power, papal system, has the incarnation of Satan working in it. Apostate Protestantism has the incarnation of Satan in it. Last week's sermon, two incarnations, two mysteries. Which one are you a part of? Because you're a part of the mystery of godliness or the mystery of iniquity. You're a part of the incarnation of Christ or the incarnation of Satan. Yeah. You cannot get away from it. You're one or the other. Therefore, the image also reveals itself as completely un under the control of the same power of paganism, the same power of the papacy, Satan. Satan never stops using paganism when he uses the next power, the papal system. We see his footprint in paganism alive in the New Age movement, in the spiritualism movements, the occult movements working in the United States and around the world. He's not dead in paganism. He just moves and works in more than one facet at a time. Satan never stops using the papal system. When he moves to the more effective deception, he doesn't stop using the papacy. But there's one thing Satan never wants you to know. Satan's greatest deception. The deception that can deceive even the elect when not connected with heaven's present truth. Satan's greatest deception is the image to the beast. Used to do all the work of the dragon. Used to do all the work of the first beast and even more. It is through this power the image to the beast. This is the power through whom Satan makes war with the remnant church. So many Adventists preach that the papacy makes war with the remnant. No, he doesn't. No, it doesn't. The image to the beast does. We're going to find out in Scripture why that is true. Note this carefully. At a time when the majority of Adventist theology is in total turmoil because of the rejection of the pioneer writings, the destruction of the books written by Uriah Smith, Daniel and the Revelation, 
Adventists today have reduced themselves to not even having a commission, a committed stance on Daniel and Revelation. Even in Adventism, Satan has his agents diverting the minds by deception. Never forget that it is the voice of God through the pioneers that gives us the right application of these prophecies. It is the image to the beast that brings the last death sentence, not the papacy. Amen. Verse 1. Fifteen of Revelation 13. And he had power. Who's the he? The two-horned two beast. United States. And the United States had power to give life to the image of the beast, which is? Apostate. Apostate Protestantism. That apostate Protestantism should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship Apostate Protestantism should be killed. And he calls us, who's the he? Ah, I'm going to catch you here. Who's this he? That's right. Oh, I'm glad you guys caught it. The first time I read this, I said, well, that's, that's the two RB. I said, no, it's not. It switches. This is apostate Protestantism. Right. Apostate Protestant causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead. Verse 17. And that no man should buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him hear. You see, everyone without some exception will be under the death decree. A death decree brought forth not by the beast, but the image of the beast. Because the image of the beast receives the power from the United States, which is the sole world civil power. No one contradicts what the United States will do at this time. Because they have made a deception. The beast has its mark and the image of the beast takes the mark of the beast as its own mark. It is the apostate Protestant church system that is being united will force common worship of Sunday which is here foretold. Note this carefully. It is the apostate Protestant system, not the papacy that enforces Sunday worship. It is the apostate Protestant system that demand from every person on the earth worship me. You see, they don't have to demand in those countries where Catholicism rules. They're already worshiping on Sunday. You don't have to tell someone to go to church on Sunday that are already there. You see? The apostate system that takes the mark of the beast and makes it its own mark of authority. The image of the beast, the apostate Protestant will be doing the work of the papal system with its approval and the support. Satan is using family emotions to bring compromise in our homes this very day. We must, and it is imperative, 
that we must steadfastly stand humble and yet firm on the settled Word of God and His prophetic truth. Amen. It will be those professing to be family in blood that will bring the greatest heartache and persecution against us if we continue to compromise truth today. We need to begin to apply what God has been trying to settle into our minds. Those who are not worshiping according to God's will are unknowingly worshiping at Satan's altar. And it is our responsibility to lovingly bring it clear truth of God to them and its eternal consequences of rejection. Listen to God's word through His Son Jesus in Matthew 12, 50. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, and mother. You see, whenever we see our true family as being those not doing the will of our Heavenly Father, we build a bridge of untold heartache and pain from the compromise done year after year. Our earthly family must never be allowed to affect even the slightest connection of applying and living present truth in our lives. Yeah. Remember, association will bring always accommodation which will lead to what assimilation. assimilation the pastor these people really don't know the truth but most a lot of ladies don't I will agree but the apostate church leadership does the United Church of God makes it very clear which day is the Sabbath? Which day is the Sabbath? Saturday or Sunday? Since most churches observe Sunday as their day of rest and worship, many people assume that Sunday is the Sabbath. This is a Sunday church talking. Down at the bottom of the pulpit. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We'd be here until 3 o'clock. <laughs> no biblical authorization for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. The next one is the Baptist. If you don't think that's good enough, here's one that says, The Scriptures nowhere call for the first day of the week the Sabbath. No scriptural authority for doing so. No nor, of course, any scriptural obligation to do so. We all know these. We believe in the law of God as eternal and unchangeable. His rule of moral government. I asked the Baptist lady back in Tennessee one time, I said, what part of the Bible is not inspired? You know, Baptists, they believe in word inspiration. And she looked at me very quizzically. And she says, there's no part of the Bible that's not inspired. I says, yes, there is. I said, there is a part of the Bible that's not inspired. And she looked at me and she says, the quizzical look on her face was just like, I don't understand. I'm going against everything she's ever been taught. And she said, what part of the Bible? Are you talking about the indexes? Are you talking about the table of contents? What part of the Bible are you talking about? I said, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. They were inspired to be put in the Bible, but they were not inspired to be written because God himself wrote them. And it says, it is absolute. An absolute can never change. So why do you go to church on the first day of the week? 
where there's nothing in the inspired part of the Bible to contradict the absolute truth of God's own writing. She says, I've got something to think about, don't I? I, it was it was an interesting conversation. She says, you know, she says, you taught me something. I'm going to have to do some more study. One old Baptist man asked a friend of mine who'd been studying with him for six months. And he walked into the Bible study and the gentleman who was the, basically the patriarch of the entire community because he was his cousins and his nephews and nieces and everybody, they all lived around him. And he said to my friend, he said, take my Bible. Show me why I keep Sunday. And you know what he did? He did just that. You know, you can show in your Bibles why someone keeps Sunday. You see, we're doing it right now, today. Methodist. Sabbath was made for man, not for the Hebrews, but for all men. Are you a human being? Sabbath made for you then. The American Congregationalist. The current notion that Christ and his apostles authoritatively substitute the first day for the seventh is, is absolutely without any authority in the New Testament. Yet these very organizations will take Sunday. We observe Roman Catholicism. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in 364 transferred its solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Note the change. Made in 364, but it wasn't until 538 when the Bishop of Rome, Vigilus, a devout pagan, appointed the death decree to anyone who observed any other day than Sunday, never to be rescinded and will be again enforced. It will, it is well to remind the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Methodists, and all other professed Christians, I'll put, that the Bible does not support them anywhere in their observance of Sunday. Sunday is an institution of the Roman Catholic Church. And those who observe the day observe a commandment of the Catholic Church. That is why Rick Warren was able to unite himself with the Pope Apostate Protestantism saying we will stand with the Catholic and we will support together and be united for law and order. Continuing, they, the Protestants, deem it their duty to keep Sunday holy. Why? Because the Catholic Church tells them to do so. They have no other reason. The observance of Sunday thus comes to an ecclesiastical law entirely distinct from the divine law of the Sabbath observance. The author of the Sunday law is the Catholic Church. Whose mark is it? They did this two weeks ago. We'll put it up again. In 1923, Sunday is our mark of authority. The Catholic Church is above the Bible. And its transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Satan and his agencies of this world say that God's law is no more needed. Only believe is the cry of professed Christians in the throngs all over the United States and the world. 
Jesus is calling for those who hear His voice, come, follow Me. Come out from the faults. Follow Me, Jesus is calling. To follow means to break every yoke. The yoke of disobedience. The yoke of self-interests. The yoke of family and ethnic traditions. The yoke of everything in this world. Why? To walk by the Holy Spirit of God, our, our, our Father. To walk by the Spirit, we will live the, by the faith of Jesus His Son. Amen. To walk by the Spirit, our lives will be abnormal. To the viewpoint of the world loving neighbor, to the world loving friend, and to the world loving family member. To walk by the Spirit brings not ease, but struggles. Unbearable without Christ in you, the hope of glory. To walk by the Spirit following Jesus as He walked will lead to a steep road filled with stones of great difficulty, thorns of past sins and inherited tendencies. To walk by the Spirit following Jesus all the way to heaven's gate will bring temptations of greatest nature. To walk by the Spirit following Jesus will find ourselves poor, forsaken, afflicted, and yes, even tormented. But no matter where the Spirit leads, no matter how rough the way, I pray we can all and we will all say together, Gladly will I follow Thee, my Savior and my King. Amen. 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 Let us stand and sing together. It's a prayer of commitment. Prayer of resolution by faith of Jesus in us that we will follow our Savior.
Sunday law. We need to understand this prophecy will be fulfilled. Time is short. Will you follow Christ all the way? It is my prayer. And I hope it is yours too. Let us kneel before the Lord and commit ourselves to Him. Loving, merciful, and gracious Heavenly Father, surely you have laid out by your servant John to your church exactly what you are going to do, exactly what the enemy is going to do. There is no reason not to know. There's no reason not to follow you. The Lord, so many will follow after cunning, devised fables because they don't trust your word of God, your word as truth. Lord, help us secure us in your truth. Settle us that we can never be moved. Trusting no matter what comes, that we will be safe in your arms. Christ in us will not just be a slogan, but a reality moment by moment. In Jesus' name, amen.